So as I mentioned early on, measurements that you make experimentally of the volume scattering function at any specific theta, you're actually measuring over a range of thetas. And that is defined by this weighting function um, and a centroid angle. That's, uh, you can decide find the centroid angle in a lot of different ways, actually. But you can see where these, the source beam and the detector beams overlap, you get the, the volumes, you get the sampling volume. And then within that sampling volume, if you're looking at light that was scattered from this point versus this point, there's going to be two totally different scattering angles for that. So we have to understand that weighting function. And um, one way we do it is by looking at the geometries of the different measurements. So these are eco sensors that wet lab cells. And this is the eco BB geometry with nominally has scattering at 124 degrees. I think there's, yeah. So the midpoint of the source and detector beams actually intersect at 120, but when you do the calculations for the weighting function, you find that the centroid's actually at 124, which I'll get to. But anyway, you got to play with these plots a lot to, to document the geometry. Uh, this is MCOMS, which is a new sensor they produced, just to show you uh, kind of what the geometry looks like for that. For the scattering measurement, this is the detector here, and, or the detector window, and then this is the source beam. The detector is looking nadir, essentially. It's looking up. And you can see that the way they built it, the source beam doesn't perfectly intersect the detector beam, which is really unfortunate. There's really no reason why they should have built it this way. Anyway, <clears throat> so how do we get these weighting functions? There's a lot of details here. I took out a lot of slides. I'm not going to bore you with a lot of the details, but I just want to go over kind of the general way we do this. Um, first, in the 90s, Mafione and Dane in 1977 did it experimentally with a plaque. And so you have your source and detector, and they move this plaque. It's a Lambertian plaque, meaning that it scatters. When light hit it, hits it, it's going to scatter that light isotropically equally in all directions. And they move that plaque away from the sensor face and so here you would not record any data because you're not in the sample volume. When you get into the sample volume, then you're going to start to record a signal. And then as you move it through the sample volume at different iterations, and obviously you're going to be in a water solution when you do this to get the refractive index right, um, you can assign an angle to each position and then add up all that information to get a weighting function. Okay? The problem with that method was that when light from the source hit a diffuser like Spectralon, it diffuses everywhere within the Spectralon. So the whole, this was done in a box, a tank, and the whole tank lit up, essentially. So the, the weighting functions were a lot more broad, we found, than, than they should be. So then we started to do it analytically. And we call this the virtual plaque method. And this is described in detail in this paper by Sullivan et al. But the original method was developed in kind of around 2000. And the way this works is we virtually step a plaque through this sample volume. At each setting of Z, we look at the intersection of the source beam and the detector beam, which is right here. So you're looking at the intersection of two ellipses. And then once you define that ellipse, you separate it into these very small elemental volumes. And each elemental volume has a dx, a dy, and a dz. And in each one of those elemental volumes, you calculate the power from the source that made it there, and then the power of the, of the, the scattered light that's going to make it to the detector. So we do that for every single dV. Every single time we do it, we assign a theta. And then for every time we get results at the same theta, you just keep filling that bin. And at the end, you've got your full weighting function. What's really important here is that this geometry, knowing these beams very, very carefully, um, knowing exactly what the geometry is of those beams. And within each of these beams, there's going to be a weighting. So there's a Gaussian weighting, approximate Gaussian weighting on the source. But Wet Labs uses cheap LEDs without any diffuser over the LEDs. So if you image one of those onto a wall, you can see it's not a perfect Gaussian. There's actually a little hole, black hole in the middle. So you got to try to take into account these effects as well. Uh, let's see. So you step through the volume, determine the area. I think I described everything 
And so doing this, the, the first weighting functions we calculated with this method in 2000, this is the original VSF, kind of these very narrow um, triangles that were centered at 100, um, 125, and 150. And then um, it was honestly after we had the mascot, we had a rigorous volume scattering device with better um, geometry, so I had a better understanding of what the weighting functions were. And we started making those measurements that I realized that these were way too narrow. So then uh, I did do, we did a lot more study on the geometry of the eco sensors, et cetera, et cetera, and did, redid the calculations. And then we got these blue curves for the eco VSF. Uh, there's a lot of different iterations, like I was saying, different flavors, and there's different angles and different geometries for different eco, eco measurements. But around 2009, these were all the values that we used. And then recently, even after this uh, Sullivan et al. 2013 paper, where all of the details of um, all the calculations and everything, all that's in there, um, we realized that it wasn't even wide enough. And that has to do. The, the geometry di didn't change, but we realized that the Gaussian weighting of the source intensity was a lot wider than we'd originally thought. So that gave us an even wider distribution. So this is currently the distribution we use for the EcoBB. It's still centered at 124. What's really important is that you know people and, and we all report these beta values from eco sensors is beta 124, for instance. And that's just the centroid angle. It's really this weighting over this entire very broad range of the volume scattering function. It goes all the way to 60 degrees at the tail. So you're even picking up a substantial amount of forward scattering light. And the VSF, remember, is going like this. So this makes a, a substantial impact into the, the values that, that, you, um, that you measure within EcoBB. You know, having a broad weighting function, there was a lot of um, logic behind that in the original design of the eco. So you notice the source beam and the detector beams are very, very broad. That's because we wanted as big a sample volume as possible while having as close to the sensor face as possible because you want to minimize the path length that the light has to travel. The farther it is away, I'll talk about that in a minute, but then you have to start worrying about attenuation corrections when that sample volume is far from the sensor face. And with a large sample volume, you're integrating a lot more of the particles in the water. If you have a very, very small sample volume, you start to see a lot of spiking from individual large particles going through the sample volume. So it's important to keep that big. So we want to minimize the path length and make the sample um, volume as big as possible. And that also gives you a relatively broad weighting over the backward direction. And the, the logic of these sensors, at least initially, was to provide backscattering coefficients for people doing ocean color remote sensing work. And if you want a backscattering coefficient, you want something that has as broad a coverage of the backscattering domain as possible. So um, this is an old slide with the old weighting functions, but the concept is exactly the same. So once you've got your weighting functions, now remember I said there isn't a solution you can buy that has an absolute known volume scattering function. So what we do is use beads because you can calculate the phase function, volume scatter, scattering function normalized to total scattering very accurately with beads. Um, bless you. So with the phase functions then you can then convolve those with the weighting functions and you get these weighted values that are specific for each measurement for that specific instrument, that specific weighting function, and that specific bead, and that specific wavelength that you're using. Each bead I would add, I mean, there's a lot of details I'm not going to get into, but two micron beads, even if they're NIST traceable, they come with a little distribution. They're not perfectly mono dispersed. And actually, taking into account that distribution is important to get the most accurate values possible. Yeah, and I, I would also add that we use Rayleigh scatters, very small diameter particles now, exclusively for our measurements because you see all these oscillations here. Um, these oscillations, if there's any uncertainty in our analytically modeled weighting function, you're going to have uncertainty <coughs> in these values that we're using in the calibration. Rayleigh scatters in the backward direction are flat. So if, if we're a little off in this shape, say it kind of looks like this, we'll still get the same weighted value for the phase function. <clears throat>
That's why we use Rayleigh scatters. So once you have that, then uh, you can stick the sensor in a solution of those beads. And you can do a suspension series of those beads. And uh, if you can measure the B, the total scattering within AC9, then you can calculate, you can see the, the volume scattering function because from here we have this specific weighted phase function, I should point to this, this specific weight, weighting function for every, um, for every measurement. So we have the scattering signal measured by the sensor and then this is the total scattering measured by an AC9. You get the suspension series and then you get the slope. And as I say here, you know, you don't need to worry about calibration of the dark counts or anything like that because the only thing you're interested in is the slope. So when I add beads, you're going to get a delta B and you're going to get a delta counts. It's going to give you a slope and that's the only thing you need from this exercise here. I should also make the small point, there's a lot of small points, but I think this one's important. When you calculate this with me theory, you also have to take into account that the B is an AC9B. So it's looking at 0.93 to 180 degrees, which means, especially with Rayleigh scatters, um, well, you're, using, you're losing several percent of the signal that has to be accounted for. So once you have this from the theory, that weighting function and knowing the phase function of the beads and bringing those together, and you have this experimental value here from the slope that I just showed you, then you have a scaling factor in beta per counts. And then you get your dark count by putting tape over the detector. And then, so you have your raw counts that you measure, you subtract the dark counts, then you multiply it by that scaling factor that I just showed you. And the scaling factor, again, is beta over counts. So you get a weighted beta for that particular sensor at the other end. And it's very important, all beta measurements are not the same. So you can have multiple sensors. You know, my beta 150 with the mascot is completely different from a beta 150 from an eco because it's a much broader weighting function with an eco. Um, the measurements in the field will include water. So the, the calibration process involved getting a slope from adding a certain amount of beads. So you got a certain amount delta change in B and a certain delta change in counts and you're resolving that change. So when you put this in the field in any solution, it's going to measure the total scattering of that solution. So there's, and actually initially we tried to, you know, kind of the logic of other sensors that, that we've calibrated over the years. Um, we tried to see in a purified water solution if we could kind of normalize everything to that. But you cannot, as we discussed earlier, make water that's clean enough to consistently do that. You can't really make, it's almost impossible to make water clean enough to make any kind of measurement like that. And especially in the backward direction. And the other point is that ambient light rejection circuitry is important, which is just an engineering concern. But um, especially near the surface, we have a lot of ambient light. And you've got very, very little light being scattered back towards the detector. It's, it's an important concern. And in early models of these sensors, it was always something that was a real challenge. Uh, so remember I said that the logic, one of the logic behind the design is that it's a very small path length. And that's to minimize this, any attenuation along the path. Um, with an eco sensor, in the calibration, it's inherently accounting for some attenuation along the path. It's a very small amount because it's a small path length, but it's inherently accounting for some of that. And it's close enough for ECOs. It's kind of a fudge because accounting for a small amount of attenuation in a very, very small particle that we're using for calibration is very, very different from the attenuation you get in the field with a natural particle population, a natural VSF. But these errors are typically on the order of, of 1% or so. So that the error you're introducing typically in doing a correction doesn't really make sense to do it. The one thing that you might need to consider is that if you measure in samples that have very high absorption, like greater than two, which is really rare, you know, obviously in the ocean, but maybe you're using this in, you know, some lake somewhere that has very, very high CDOM and it's a blue wavelength, for instance, then you can make a correction here that's based on the path length of the sensor, which is typically depending on the particular flavor, one to two centimeters, the absorption coefficient that can be resolved with an AC device, and it gives you a corrected value. We never do this with eco. We almost never do it with ecos, because just in very clear water, typical of the ocean, it injects more uncertainty. So again, it's an approximation when the path length is small. 
With a mascot, um, I'm not going to go into these details, but path length is not small with a mascot. So you've got 10 centimeters approximately to the, the sample volume, which is exactly the middle of this semicircle. And then you've got about 10 centimeters to each one of these detectors. So the total path length is 20 centimeters. And so this is the only slide I have on it. But just want to show you the full correction here. So with an eco, the only thing we have to deal with is this. You just take your counts, subtract a dark count, and multiply it by a scaling factor. But when you have attenuation to consider, you've got to add this parameter here, which is your path length. This is total scattering for particles. This is the fraction of particles of scattering that is included in the measurement. Your absorption and your absorption of water, which is at 658.34. And then you can add reference calculations if, if you need to. Um, but this, this gets pretty tedious. And you have to consider this during the calibration. And then you have to apply all of this in, um, in processing your data after you measure it as well. Uh, it's a significant extra step. You could do all this with an eco, but all the added work, like I said, is buying you maybe a percent. It turns out with um, the mascot, so this fraction of scattering that is not included in the measurement. So there's a lot of scattering that is included in the measurement. You can see the beams coming out here. And there's this, most of the scattered light, again, is going to be in the very near forward. So it's still going to make it to the sample volume. And then you've got light scattered from the sample volume to the detector. And similarly, you're going to get a lot of light scattered in that near forward collected by the detector. And it turns out that the fraction for the mascot is about 50%. About half the light is collected by the sample volume in the detector. That's also going to be a function of the specific volume scattering function that you have in the solution. So you have to consider that in this correction as well. So moving on to. Uh, Polarization, I already showed you this. This is Voss and Fry's Mueller matrix for kind of generic average seawater. And we were able to put a, a filter wheel in front of the source on the mascot so we can put different polarization filters here. And by doing that, we can start to resolve the polarization um, elements of the Mueller matrix in that top row. So we can get this one, which is really important, degree of linear polarization. And then as I mentioned, these two might be indicative of, of particle orientation um, if they deviate from zero. It's a very challenging measurement to make because, again, you have to subtract two different measurements, two different orientations. If you're using polar, uh, circularly polarized light here, you're subtracting two numbers that are very large. So uh, in practice, this is really noisy. And trying to piece out any kind of preferential orientation that might be happening is, is difficult. Yeah, and this, this just shows the calculations you have to do for each of the different ones. I'm not, not going to go into it. Yeah, yeah, and there's transmission filament. And so here are some, some of the measurements. I showed you some before from Sergeant Barber Channel. These are from Curacao in 2012. And um, here's the Rayleigh ideal again. So it's fully depolarized at 90 degrees. So we never see that in the water column in, in reality, which you really shouldn't because there's a lot of stuff there besides very small Rayleigh type particles. But we see depolarization that varies from about 0.9 in surface waters to about 0.5 in deep waters in a single cast. So there's a good range. And again, this is as you increase refractive index, this comes down. As you increase the proportion of large particles, it also brings it down. You can see that um, also as it brings it down, it also skews it a little bit to larger angles. Again, we only have 90 and 100, so it's interpolation involved. But it changes the shape as well. There's a lot of information here that is waiting to be mined, really. I also wanted to measure another way of, uh, of deriving total scattering. Because uh, you know, in reality, we really don't have a method of measuring total scattering. We derive it with an AC9 by subtracting A from C. Um, this is a method that measures it directly. And it's actually really, really simple. And this is a project that we had for a few years. This is based on a, a paper by Butel and Breuer from, I think it was 1949. And, uh, but they, we call it the inverse Butel Breuer technique because what they did, instead of having a collimated source and a detector, it's a cosine collector completely open to the entire hemisphere. They had um, a cosine, they're collimating optics on the detector, so they had collimating. 
um, field of view, uh, the beam, for the detector beam was collimated, and the source beam was completely isotropic. <laughs> but anyway, this, this works just as well, and it's a lot more convenient to implement um, with current technology, such as lasers. But what you do is you have a cosine collector, and if you take a cosine collector and you put it so that it's parallel to your source beam and integrating over this entire area, you actually have the sine theta weighting that you need in the integration of the VSF to get total B. So you can integrate over this entire beam. So it, this, is, this detector is integrating over this entire beam to give you a total scattering coefficient. It still has acceptance angle issues, though, because this has to be close enough to have a practical sensor. And this was designed so you could stick it on a, a glider. This is about eight centimeters separation. Um, and you're going to have some angle here of scattering that it, you know, it can't measure anything smaller than that. And that's what this is modeling. So this, this black here is a perfect sign dependence on a log-log scale. And with various geometries we calculated, actually using the same weighting function techniques we did for other sensors, um, what the weighting function would be and what the acceptance angle would be. So we tried to develop something that had about a one degree acceptance angle consistent with the, the AC9 and then calibrated it with an AC9 and then validated it with an AC9. So this is over 100,000 points collected on a Toyo, a wide range of um, B values, and it does a really good job. The reason it's, it's not linear is because there's attenuation along that eight centimeter path length. So you have to correct for that. So that's what this is showing here. There's an, so here's this exponential is correcting for that. Or it's just you need it in this fit, and then when you actually want to calibrate B from the counts, you have to correct for it. But there's a there's an eight centimeter path length. 0.34 is the absorption of water, and then this is a coefficient to describe well how much scattering uh, we're getting. And the comparisons with the AC9 were excellent. And the fact that we're looking at forward scattering primarily on this detector means we had an excellent, excellent signal. So the signal to noise is really was really just as good as an AC9. So it turns out Ed Fry at Texas A&M has been developing sensors for many, many years. And this is the same Ed Fry from Pope and Fry, the pure water values that Jean Ping discussed in his lecture. But he developed something very, very similar in his lab, where there's a laser source coming into the medium. And then there's a Teflon diffuser here for the detector. And he's got the window for the optical source right at the point of the diffuser. So this diffuser is integrating all the scattering out here. So it's just looking at backscattering. So the sensor we developed was looking at total scattering. And he's designed something here to look at backscattering with a very similar concept. So we actually got together at one ocean optics meeting and said we should build a sensor that combines the two and got some funding to do it. And that's what this shows. So this would be the total scattering sensor. And this is the backscattering sensor here. And this is a little optical window with a Gerson tube just making that, um, that exiting beam be right at the point of the, the, the Teflon diffuser. This is getting a lot more complicated now because we found out that having Teflon here doesn't act like a perfect cosine collector. And uh, Ed's lab has spent over a year now trying to develop the perfect cosine collector, which apparently is very difficult to do. And we're really realizing that uh, when you buy a cosine collector radiometer and a radiance sensor from a place like Satlantic, that there's actually a lot of fudging that goes on with those measurements. So it's been a pretty interesting process. So in backscattering coefficients, if you had Ed's type of design for a sensor, then you would have a backscattering coefficient, exactly 90 to 180 degrees scattered or integrated measurement. For the ECOs, you don't have that. You're measuring scattering, I say at a single angle, but it's a, it's a single weighted beta in the backward hemisphere. So what you do is you come up with a single weighted chi value that is simply a proportionality between this weighted beta that you're measuring and the backscattering coefficient that you really want. And there's a variety of different papers who have studied this. Um, and uh, there's different recommendations for which theta you want to use for that chi value or which measurement to which angle to make your measurement at to get the best representation of the backscattering coefficient. Um, which these three are all pretty much the same. Afion and Dana recommended 140. But um, 
in Sullivan and Twardowski, we showed that the, with all the mascot data that we have, that the shape of the backward VSF is remarkably consistent. And so because of that, it really doesn't matter which angle you use. You get a little bit more accuracy if you do pick something in this range, but this would actually work pretty well. So this is all described in detail in uh, that Sullivan et al. paper. OK. So uh, you guys are familiar with this, right? All right. And we were talking about the interference filters on the wheel that's spinning to get the different spectral discrimination with an AC device. These are called linear variable filters, and there's two of them in the current iteration of the sensors. So one goes from the short blue to the kind of greenish yellow, and the other one goes from the kind of continues from the greenish yellow to the near IR. And as this thing spins around, there's a source beam that's imaged onto the filter, and they register it as it flies by, collecting data as it flies by. And before, they have this whole registration process so they know exactly where they are in the filter and can assign a specific absorption or attenuation to that, that particular wavelength. The AC9 was one of those in the practical as well. It has nine independent ir interference filters on the wheel. So it's a little different. Um, and so this is data from an ACS very, very early on collected by Sullivan and Donahue of a huge particle um, layer they found in the uh, Irish Fjord. I don't know the name of it. Um, but it was dominated by this K. Uh, Mickey Motoy, uh, which is, I believe is a dinoflagellate. But this is what they measured in situ in that layer, and they had both an AC9 and an ACS. So you can see the matchup it was uh, excellent. Um, and then this was uh, an absorption spectrum collected by Starr and Cullen for the same organism in culture in the lab with a spectrophotometer. And you can see the, the shapes are, are very, very similar. There's some uh, structure here that they're not getting, but it's very similar. I should mention, too, that in practice, where these two filters are cut, you're measuring, uh, it's, it's like right in here. And so you're, you're making two sets of measurements that are slightly time disjuncted. So you, in, if you look in real time, you actually see this with the two spectra, and then often if you average one over a certain given you know, amount of time, depending on what kind of particles are there and their frequency and everything, then you start to get a spectrum that looks like this. Um, but there's some caveats there, because recently, apparently, wet labs have started filtering across here to try to minimize that apparent discrepancy, which has just messed everything up. Because when they actually are supposed to look good and you do all the averaging, now you see a stair step where you, you didn't before. So. Apparently, they're working on that right now. So we talked yesterday about um, different ways to make uh, different IOP measurements with the AC devices. And this is something that we've used a lot over the years, a kind of a dual AC9 configuration. I just wanted to go over it real quick. So you can see here, this AC9 has a filter, like you guys were using, or uh, Emmanuel showed you yesterday. And uh, we have it going through a Y into both the C and the A channel. And then you can see here the plumbing like we were talking about yesterday, to get rid of the bubbles, it's got to go all the way through and up to the top. And here's the degassing Y with a little Teflon insert. And then it comes down to the pump, which you can't see on the other side. You get the same thing for measuring totals with the other one, but we have two independent intakes. They're at the same depth as the filter. And we use independent intakes because we found that with a, a Y, you can actually get particle sorting with the Y. So one channel would go up, the other one would go down, especially if you pressurize the system. But again, it goes up to a degassing Y, et cetera. Um, yeah, with this configuration, you can get all of these IOPs. So you get the, the CPG, so particles and Gelbstoff, A, the absorption of that, the c -dom absorption. By difference, you can get the particulate attenuation and the particulate absorption, yeah, particulate absorption and the particulate scattering, the difference of uh, CP minus AP. Emmanuel also has the switcher he was talking about. So even with one AC device, you can have a switcher here that goes between the filter and totals. And so you can do one profile filter and then do another pro profile total. And you can do all of that with a single AC device. And there's the added benefit, as Manuel was saying yesterday, that 
the calibration when you do that, that subtraction with the same device cancels. So it's actually probably the most accurate measurement you could possibly make is particulate attenuation and particulate, um, or specifically particulate absorption with that switching technique. And he's done that on the TARA with great success. And the instrument's been drifting the entire time. And he still gets particulate absorption spectra with, frankly, incredible uh, signal to noise. OK, yeah. I wanted to show this real quick because uh, it kind of illustrates the um, acceptance angle issue. So if you want to resolve attenuation in a body of water, you bring a, a light source. You have collimating optics, so you have a collimated beam. You put a detector on it. And then you have a beam splitter here to measure your reference. Um, but the problem, if you do this, is that you also get some scattered light reaching that detector. Um, so this is pretty similar to uh, a standard spectrophotometer. The light source, the, the detector will be a little bit out here. There will be a hole here in your cuvette. Or, or you have your cuvette and then a hole in the spectrophotometer where the light will be read by the detector. But you know, acceptance angles with spectrophotometers, depending on the spectrophotometer, is usually several degrees. So you don't want to collect that scattered light. So uh, what you can do is move it back and then put collimating optics here. And this path length, or this focal length and the slit kind of determines what your acceptance angle is going to be. And you've got to dial that into a number that you think is appropriate for how the sensor is going to be applied. But the theoretically ideal sensor has an acceptance angle of 0, but then you're not measuring any light, so you need to compromise. And uh, yeah, at some point, I got this table from, from Colin that uh, shows for different attenuation meters on the market uh, what their acceptance angle is. So it goes from 0.018 for a model of the list to 1.9 for a model of the C star. And then you have different path lengths. So there's all these compromises when you try to divide, design an attenuation device. So the size, so if you go to very small acceptance angles, you have to have longer fo focal lengths. It increases the size of the instrument. Signal to noise. Turbulence, you know, some of these, these are both smaller than 0.1 degrees, and you can definitely see turbulence in uh, that attenuation measurement. So all of that factors in. And again, the error is approximately integrating your volume scattering function from 0 to the acceptance angle. In practice, it's not a perfect stair step. It's going to be some kind of weighting again. And then remember, you know, it's very, very steeply forward peaked so that the associated errors with these different acceptance angles are really remarkable. They're huge. 0.93 degrees with a, an AC9 seaside, you get between 19 and 30% of the B that you're missing. And uh, you know, people forget about this all the time. You know, every paper you ever read, you know, with AC9 data, say our B was this and our C was this. It's not C. It's you're 30 percent or 20 percent lower than what the actual C was. So uh, it's an important thing to to remember, and I at least would recommend always whatever C meter you're using in your research, make sure in the methods you indicate what the acceptance angle was for that that device. If you're trying to use Scattering and attenuation is a proxy for particles. Um, you know, there's a variety of different proxies that, that you can use optical measurements for. A lot of times, this isn't such a bad thing, and um, you know, certainly a good thing not to have turbulence in there or refractive index discontinuity scattering if you're interested in particles. So you want to, you know, there's some logic in having that acceptance angle be a little larger. But if you're trying to do remote sensing, trying to do radio transfer, and you need to have very precise optical properties, and you're trying to match that up with radiometric measurements, these kind of things really have to be considered and are important. So yeah, and I would make the, the, the point that this range here is because there's, there's natural variability in that volume scattering function shape in the near forward. So I also want to make one comment on accuracy. Um, so accuracy, you get these fluctuations in, in attenuation. You normalize that to C. That's your accuracy. That's approximately equal to this relationship here times the electronic noise. And your accuracy is optimized when you minimize the fluctuations normalized to C. And if you plot that versus path length for water that's 4 inverse meter C, 
This is what that curve looks like. And what's happening when it's very short path length is that you're trying to resolve small changes with a very, very small path length. So you're, trying, you're kind of in the bit noise of the measurement. You can't really resolve those very, very small changes. So your accuracy is poor. And then as your wavelength gets, your path length gets very, very long, then you're just not seeing much light at all by the detector. So you start to get very, very noisy there. So your ac accuracy is not optimized there. Accuracy is optimized at this point, 1 over C of the water that you're trying to, to resolve C in. So for an AC9, so this is 0.25 meters for C equals 4 inverse meter water. So AC9 is optimized for 4 inverse meter water, which is really turbid water. Yeah, so you don't really see that anywhere in the ocean. Um, you see some coastal waters, resuspension event, you know, it's a very, very high number. Um, and choose path length accordingly. The reason the AC9 works still in very, very clear water is because this number is, is incredibly low. And it's something that, um, you know, I could definitely say that, uh, you know, we've been spoiled over the years because the AC9 in terms of accuracy is really an incredible instrument. The fact that it goes in the water, you have to worry about pressure changes, all the temperature changes, salinity changes, all the things that we talked about yesterday. And it still gives us like 0, 0, 001 or less just random noise. And our bias errors we can get to like 0, 0, 002 to 0, 0, 005 is really incredible. If you ever try to make these measurements on a benchtop spectrophotometer with a 10 centimeter path length, usually you can't come close to what an AC9 can do. It's pretty amazing. And I would also say, too, that um, especially for absorption, um, currently it's not good enough. If you're trying to do closure, if you're trying to understand uh, absorption changes on very fine scales, um, especially, well, with the reflect reflective tube method, there's issues with forward scattered light not being, um, or forward scattered light makes it to the detector, but you get this error from all the light scattered in the back backward direction that does not make it to the diffuser. So there's a big scattering error with a reflective tube absorption meter, and even though you have this, this very fine resolution, there's still a, um, a lot of error with absorption measurements with this particular approach even with the incredible electronics that they have. So this is uh, adapted from a paper by Ron Zonnefeld et al., 1992, uh, with the schematic for the reflective tube absorption measurement of the AC device. Uh, the source end is exactly the same as a C meter. We have the beam splitter, collimating optics beam splitter reference detector. It goes through the tube, but on the detector end, we have a diffuser across the entire window and a very large area detector. And then the tube is a quartz tube with air behind it. And so that gives you total internal reflection within the tube out to 41.7 degrees. So you're collecting most of that scattered light. And then since we know the VSF is so steeply sloped, 0 to 41.7 is a lot of the light. So that's a really good thing. Um, <clears throat> and there's corrections that, that Ron et al. developed to correct for that scattered light. Typically, we think the air is about 15 to 22% of B, which is, if you think about the volume scattering function going out to 41.7 degrees, this seems a lot more than it should be, and it's because of this. So these are weighting functions for that scattering air that would actually model the McKee et al. by uh, Jacek Piskazub. And uh, even when you have perfect reflectivity, it's not a stair step at 41.7 degrees, where you get zero light lost to 41.7 41 degrees, and 100% of the light gained, or yeah, loss, loss from the measurement gained in the measurement. So the weighting function, this is actually the weighting function of the air, so it's the opposite other way around. But anyway, I think you see what I'm talking about. It's not a stair step here. So, these are different reflectivities of the tube. We talked a little bit about this yesterday, but they modeled it between 95% and 100% reflectivity. And the error is going to be taking any one of these, convolving it with your volume scattering function and integrating, and that's going to be the total error for the measurement. So I'm not going to go into detail, I don't think. Nope. 
I'm not going to go into detail of this, but in this paper right here that um, we're just about to submit, since we've independently measured the volume scattering function, we can convolve that with these different weighting functions, get the error, subtract the error so we have what we think is true A, and we compared it with the psi cam of Rudy Rocker. So this is it's an integrating cavity where he puts in the whole sample. And Rudy's done an amazing job of uh, calibrating it and um, just trying to uh, assess all the errors and correct for all the errors. Um, so this is one of the best absorption measurements you can possibly make right now. And we found that with reflectivities between 97 and 98 percent, we could subtract the error and get absorption values that agreed with Rudy with excellent precision. So we think that that error now in the corrected absorption with this method is on the order of just a few percent. Um, and we think this variability from 97 to 98, it might be a tiny bit bigger. We only tested a few flow cells, but um, it could be due to aging of the AC device tubes over time. So every time you clean it, maybe it's, uh, it's changing a little bit. But um, it's a really big correction. But, and there's a lot of other ways to resolve absorption, like the SciCam. Um, there's even a SciCam that Trios has now built to go in water, which is really exciting. And uh, we're going to try one of those out with Rudiger um, in January on a cruise uh, off the Florida coast. Um, there's lots of other ways to measure absorption. I just want to mention that. But the topic is scattering. And I'm just showing you the absorption part, because this is how B is derived with an AC9. So, when you have B from an AC9, it's got convolved errors from scattering that hopefully you corrected well, but you may have some residual errors from that. And then you also have this acceptance angle issue with the C side. So you always have to consider that with the B measurement um, that you're making. So now I'm going to go on to interpretation and application. So why are we measuring scattering? There's obviously, if you want to calculate radiative transfer through water, light propagating through water, you need to know the volume scattering function. That's one reason. But a lot of people use these measurements as a proxy for biogeochemical properties in water. So particle concentration, chlorophyll concentration, pigments, size, density. There's a whole variety of things that, that you can glean from measuring these optical properties in various ways. And there's been lots and lots of papers written on it. Um, the main caveat I want to mention is that Pools of particulate dissolved material can be highly variable. So you can get these relationships between optical properties and, say, total particle concentration or total suspended mass. But since they are complex and variable in composition, you're going to see these simple relationships not hold everywhere. You can't come up with a universal relationship. It's important to realize. Um, so yeah, general passive applications. So AOPs, you know, you can get AOPs from ocean color, reflectance. And you can get IOPs from that with analytical models from first principles. And then the IOPs, you can come up with models that may be analytical, may be empirical. The empirical way is here. Um, analytical is more what Darius was showing. where You got C and N over V and trying to do it that way and sum up all the particle characteristics. It's very challenging to do. Or you can do it empirically. So just saying I measured my C and I'm measuring particle concentration, you do that over a, a dynamic range of hopefully a large dynamic range, and you come up with a relationship that you can then apply. Uh, but you can also do it empirically from reflectance. And a lot of algorithms, obviously, have been developed for getting biogeochemical properties from ocean color empirically. Oops. And a point to make is that usually, if we call something analytical, it's usually semi-analytical, because almost always you're going to need some empiricism in the analytical relationships. And similarly, empiricism, you're usually going to use some kind of theoretical principle in developing that, that relationship. Yeah, so this is just a, at, at one time I put together a, uh, a table of all the different biogeochemical properties that were derived from various optical properties. I just wanted to point that out, just restating the list I already showed. Here's some examples of total attenuation versus TSM. This is Peterson, 1990, 1977. So this was at Oregon State, working with Ron Zonnefeld with one of the first transmissometers. Um, and reasonable correlations for each regression, but again, different water masses, you would get different slopes. 
This is uh, attenuation versus TSM, the some measurements we made in Long Island Sound. And what, the main thing I wanted to point out here is this has a slope of almost exactly one, which I always use for like the coastal ocean and open ocean is like a rule of thumb. Um, if you're trying to, if you have TSM measurements and you're trying to estimate what your attenuation in that water should be, I always just use a, a, a slope of one to estimate that, just as a crude um, estimate. This is uh, from Hill et al. in 2011, and he looked at CP over SPM, so I just said that should be about one for coastal water and open ocean water versus SPM to look at the, the effect on magnitude, and he shows this kind of inverse relationship. And then, yeah, the value of one would be in the, the very clearest waters, which is typically the waters we're working in. So this, is, this gets a very, very high concentrations of suspended matter. And what he's seeing here, the effect he's seeing here is primarily aggregation. And aggregation has, it has the effect of decreasing your CP over SPM. I think Emmanuel probably has some great practicals on that. You'll see. This is from Greet Newkerman's et al. publication in 2012, showing uh, CP from the list, CP from a sea star, a wet lab sea star, which I haven't met mentioned, but that's other than the AC9, they have a much more compact uh, transmissometer called a sea star, has a larger acceptance angle. This is backscattering coefficient, and this is uh, backscattering from a uh, an NTU device, I believe, and this is all versus SPM. She gets very, very nice linear relationships with excellent R squares, 9, 4, 9, 7, 9, 9, uh, 9, 7. Typically, it's interesting, the backscattering measurements do better than, um, than the attenuation measurements. But uh, depending on which sensor you have and the field of view or the acceptance angle, you're going to get different relationships. Um, but this was all, I think, in the North Sea. so. Um, probably very similar particle composition, which is why she's getting such high R squareds. It's also a log-log plot. Um, here are other published TSM uh, over CP, so uh, values that you can find in the literature. Uh, these are different units, unfortunately, but everybody's just saying 0.45 to 2.5, and I was saying one was kind of a, an average, anyway. CP has been used to estimate POC. So again, you get nice linear relationships in specific water masses, but you get different slopes depending on the composition of the water and that particular composition of the particles in that particular water mass. Uh, this is from uh, work by Darius et al. Uh, looking at POC and backscattering. Very, very nice relationship in the raw sea. This is from uh, Hubert Loisel at all, and they got another very nice relationship in different water mass. So again, the likely causes of variability, okay, you've got particle composition, but there's also differences in how the POC and the BBP, um, they're all resolved. And obviously, you know, one of the big things is you've got to collect particles on a filter with TSM or POC. That filter has a pore size, whereas your backscattering measurements are made in whole water. So you're losing a whole fraction of your, your size distribution with that. So those kind of things need to be accounted for in these kind of relationships. Uh, Jim Bishop et al. used a C meter as a POC detector. He called it his carbon explorer. And uh, this was published in Science. And uh, he noted in the North Pacific, following a dust deposition event, that um, there was a big bloom. So this is the dust deposition. And then this was the big bloom that happened. Although, if you're measuring C, dust would obviously scatter light. So I'm not quite sure how he's discriminating between those two. Um, particle size distribution slope from spectral attenuation. So uh, this has been studied, obviously, for a long time. Volts looked at it in the atmosphere. And Morel looked at it um, in water. Here's another excellent Morel publication. This is an Agard lecture from 1973 that's been translated to English. and uh, Highly recommend uh, you read that. Um, but if you assume a, for the particle size distribution, a power law, also known as a young type slope or a young type relationship for a PSD, then you expect this very, very simple relationship between the slope of the attenuation spectrum, slope of C, and the slope of the power law. 
for size distribution. And then uh, in 2001, Manuel et al. put finite particle size limits in those calculations and came up with this extra term in the relationship. So um, in 2001, we also developed a model to solve for bulk refractive index based on the backscattering coefficient, so the backscattering ratio. So we were plotting some of the first um, backscattering data, and we always saw that the backscattering ratio always increased as you got towards the bottom, and whereas a lot of suspended particles. And then plankton layers, this chlorophyll maximum, it always reached a minimum. So I started to do a bunch of me calculations trying to understand it better and uh, you know, realized after I'd done all the calculations and had the paper as a manuscript and I sent it to Ron, to, who's a co-author, to review and he said, well, actually, a lot of these were done by <laughs> Morel in 1973. He pretty much came up with the same thing. But uh, one thing we did was like analytically formalize it in equations so it's, it's very easy to implement um, in practice. But what's happening is that when you go from low refractive index particles that are filled with cytoplasm that is similar refractive index to the um, surrounding medium, so it's a relatively low, it's a low relative refractive index, that you have little associated backscattering, relative backscattering from that, but if you have a hard particle, a like quartz, something with a high refractive index, you're going to backscatter light more strongly. So it's kind of intuitive. Um, and so we, for a, a population of um, homogeneous spheres, so we use Lorenz Mie theory, and for a population defined by that Younger type relationship, which is a power law with a slope s, we calculated backscattering ratio and refractive index and, and just plotted it all here. And so you can see that for these different contours of refractive index, 1.02 to 1.2, the backscattering ratio goes up. So this was from me theory, and then we came up with an analytical representation of all these different contours so that you could invert it. But in the water column, this is all from the Gulf of California. So this is in the deep chlorophyll max, so you get a, an N falling on these contours about 1.04, 1.05. And then in the deep water where we have resuspension, it gets up to 1.18. And then uh, you can see here in this range, 2.5 to 3.5 for slopes that it's relatively consistent. This, this youngest slope isn't really changing much. So it's almost, per, it's almost totally a function of your backscattering ratio. And so that's where this plot came from that, that Zhang Ping showed the other day, where then you can solve for refractive index with a very simple um, power law relationship relative to uh, backscattering ratio. But this is only, um, it's only uh, appropriate for 2.5 to 3.5 um, particle size distribution slopes, which for the most part, open ocean with very small particles, you see a lot of 3.5 to 4, but this does encapsulate a lot of the coastal ocean at least. I also just wanted to touch on VSF inversion. I did not want to get um, too much into this, but um, because these shapes for bubbles in particular and relatively high refractive index and the ba high, high backscattering in the, yeah, for uh, mineral particles because of higher refractive index. Um, these two volume scattering function shapes in particular are very, very different. And so when we made measurements in the surf zone, you could really distinguish these different types and you can create a library like I, what I was talking about with the list. You can create a library of larger angle scattering for these VSFs, these phase functions, and fit the library to the measurements to do an inversion and solve for the bubbles and the sediment populations. So these are specific sediment populations that we, um, that we inverted for. And this is the concentration of these two different sediment populations. And this was verified uh, visually. I mean, at this point during the measurements, we started to have breaking waves, a lot of resuspension. And then here were sediment plumes that came by. And then we did the same thing with the bubble population. And there were no bubbles here until we had the breaking waves. And then we had bubble injection. So these are the large bubbles here. And remember, the, the mid-angle enhancement is right around 70 to 80 degrees. So if you just simply take beta 70 and divide by beta 20, it's a very good index for these large bubbles. You can see that this very simple parameter is 
pretty closely correlating with that. Yeah, and we had an uh, acoustic resonator as well looking at, uh, from uh, Dave Farmer's group that was looking at the, uh, the bubble concentration as well with multiple frequencies, mul which each frequency, unlike optics, acoustics is a little easier because each frequency is assigned to a specific bubble size. Um, but you can see the correlation here between uh, our inverted measurements of the bubbles and what was measured with the acoustics is, is very good. One final point is this, if you're ever studying bubbles, we were talking earlier with a gentleman about um, trying to use optics to study bubbles. Surfactants are really important. And this was an experiment in East Sound where we were sitting here with our stuff hanging over the side, all of our uh, equipment, and then Alan Whiteman was in a boat and buzzed us. And uh, after we went by, we went over his prop trail to look at the bubbles that were left in the water. And this is that simple ratio. This is in, case, in this case, it's beta 80 to beta 120. But we could see persistent. Every time we went over that prop trail, we could see the effect of bubbles out to an hour, which is really incredible. We didn't really expect that. Um, and then we also had the acoustic resonator where we saw the same thing. Um, and the reason why they were so persistent is because surfactants were in the water and stabilized the bubbles. Um, because theory would predict that like 50 micron bu bubbles would be buoyant and come out of the water in a matter of seconds. So it still amazes me there were 50 micron bubbles that were sitting in subsurface water for, for over an hour after the bubble went by. Okay. So somebody else was asking me about this azimuthal symmetry um, uh, assumption that we make with the VSF. And uh, these are measurements that we're just started, we've just been making the last few years of looking at any preferential particle orientation in water. Because if particles are preferentially orienting, then this random orientation that we have to assume in all the measurements we make and all the modeling we do um, is going to have problems. So Jim Sullivan led development of an in-situ holographic microscope. And it can take holographic images of all the particles in a volume that is undisturbed as it cores the water column. So the measurements are made in here, and if you go at just the right rate through the water column, you're not going to disturb the water. And these are the kind of images that we get. And lo and behold, they're all oriented. I mean, all the, these long chains in this particular case were oriented. Um, so this was in a particle peak that was centered at 3.5 meters of this, this didylum that I showed before that we've modeled the scattering properties of. And we also were measuring the shear through the water. So there was also a shear layer here associated with the particle layer. And that's how these particle layers form, through shear layers, typically on density stair steps. And this is looking at the orientation of the entire particle field from negative 90 to 90. And it's a probability distribution function. This is the downcast. And then this is the upcast. So the upcast, we're mixing everything up. So the upcast, the orientation is just random. It's all the same through the whole water column. But in the downcast, we saw preferential orientation, but not even in this layer, but throughout the entire water column. And as you got towards the bottom, we saw preferential orientation in the vertical. Here, this is preferential orientation near zero. So this is preferential orientation horizontally. So we're just starting to try to piece together kind of the, the impacts, potential impacts on the optics. Um, this is in a place east sound Washington where you see a lot of thin layers form. I, I personally, we haven't made these measurements in other locations. Um, and Emmanuel says, well, this is, this is just East Sound. East Sound is totally unique in the world. But I don't believe it. I think that this is wherever we have shear layers, shear layers are going to take non-spherical particles and orient them and flow. And this guy's a physicist, and he backs me up. <laughs> We're just talking about it. Um, and then, you know, based on the orientation, you can calculate photons absorbed or be the exact same things for photons scattered. It's all a function of the cross-section of the particle. So if light's coming down through the water and you have a flat particle, you're going to absorb a lot of light. And as it rotates to vertical, you're going to absorb much, much less light. So that means that if you're doing radiative transfer, you have to be very concerned about your exact orientation in the water. If you even measuring optical properties, like with a mascot, for instance, you have to be concerned about the orientation of the sensor. Because if the, if, the, if the semicircle of detectors is like this, and you're going through the water column, the source beam is coming this way, 
and you're going to see very little cross-section of those particles. If you turn it 90 degrees, now you're going to get a much, much higher cross-section because you're going into the board. So these kind of issues are just something that we're starting to, uh, to think about and also think about in terms of trying to design scattering devices that can try to resolve these kind of spatial variability um, in the water column. Because it's a very complicated problem. If you can imagine a scattering device where you have rings of detectors and even rings of sources in kind of a globe to measure all these different orientations of a volume in the middle, how do you stick that in the water without mixing everything up? Um, there's actually, in the atmosphere, this is very, very well known, and there's optical guys have been studying it for a century. And they have volume scattering functions that are like a big ring filled with detectors and also sources, and they fly that through the atmosphere to look at orientation. Um, so maybe something like that would, would work here. Anyway, this is just something to, um, and I was asked about it specifically, so just something that, that, you know, to consider in the future. And part of what I'm trying to do with the talk is give you guys kind of the, kind of where the field is and where, you know, there are things that could be done in the future to kind of stand on the shoulders of all these guys who've done such great work in the past. Um, I also had imaging in my synopsis, so I have one slide on imaging, and we developed an algorithm here that's adapted from this paper, a very, very good paper by Will Halladall. Zhang Ping is a co-author on that, looking at up looking uh, range for visibility. And this was for the Navy. So the Navy has this camera, and this is mounted on subs. And they're trying to image stuff on the bottom of boat holes. And they won't tell me what it is, but they're trying to image something. And so uh, they were finding that, obviously, in some waters, they had no range for imaging. It was just really blurry because it was turbid. And they wanted to be able to predict that better. So develop this algorithm. So this is just attenuation. This is diffuse attenuation coefficient. This is the limiting contrast of their particular camera. This is the contrast of the target, which if it's black-white target, like these targets, it's just one. This is a scattering coefficient, diameter of that target, which in this case is the width of these bars. And the only thing that's a little funky is this is the, the shape of the near forward volume scattering function, but you can approximate that pretty well. It's, it's kind of a small range um, of values that will work. And so to be able to predict this, we built a sensor package that measures C. This is a BAM sensor, so this is another transmissometer by Wet Labs that measures C, and it's it's, it's compatible with very small um, instrumentation packages. There's also a, um, a radiometer on there, a cosine collector, so we can get our K. And there's also a backscattering sensor in there that you could use to derive other properties if you wanted to. But what we were doing in testing to show them uh, hopefully that it worked was we'd bring it up to the top and then take a, a vertical profile so we get all this information. They had great software engineers that put this into a GUI, and then they slowly brought it up, and they were watching a video screen, and they looked at the point which they could discriminate this contrast, and then that was the Z, so that was the way of validating the, uh, the relationship. And of course, you know, since I said I didn't know this, you could guess at that for the specific limiting contrast of the camera. Since I didn't know this, it was a fudge factor. So no matter, you know, when they came over the first time, we said, okay, that's the range. We plugged in the value that made it work, but it turned out that made it work the entire time, different you know, turbidities, et cetera. This is just showing you another application of, of scattering um, that a lot of people, especially like the Navy, are very interested in. And then finally, I know a lot of you are interested in ocean color. Uh, I just want to talk about the relevance of the VSF to ocean color. So obviously, you guys have seen this relationship a lot. Here's kind of a schematic you know, of what's happening in terms of how the light is being reflected out of the water. Um, I wanted to point out, I don't know why. Oh. So initially, a detector, an OCI, ocean color imager, is going to be measuring water leaving radiance. And it's going to be a function of its specific viewing angle, so the zenith and the azimuth, and the solar zenith, wherever that was. And that's going to make a specific scattering angle in the water, you know, once it's refracted through the interface. And then what NASA does is they apply drift corrections for the ocean color imager. They apply atmospheric corrections based on the viewing geometry. 
And then Morel has this uh, amazing paper that really is a, a synthesis of, of a lot of work he was doing over the previous decade, where there's a bidirectional reflectance distribution function to correct for the viewing angle and the solar zenith angle. So what it does is it takes the viewing angle and makes it exactly nadir. And with the solar, whatever the solar zenith is, it makes it exactly zenith. Then you have what Kurt was talking about. There's other stuff too, like you have to normalize it to the irradiance at the top of the atmosphere, et cetera. But then you have what Kurt was talking about, this normalized water leaving radiance, which is looking at pi nadir radiance and your solar zenith of zero. And then this is plugged into algorithms like what John Ping talked about the other day. And this has been an amazingly useful you know, relationship derived from radiative transfer, obviously, um, for many decades, and a lot of great science has been done with it. One thing I'd like to point out, though, is, you know, once you get normalized water leaving radiance, and this BRDF, obviously, is controlled by the VSF. So if you're this geometry, you know, this scattering angle here, that's what you're correcting for with the BRDF. And then as geometry changes, the VSF, the scattering angle, is going to change. You have to correct for that. But once you do this correction, and you're, you're looking at Nader, and the sun is right there as well, is BB the, the value that you're resolving at that point? If you've got solar energy going straight into the water, and you've got a detector looking at the exact same orientation, what, what scattering angle are you looking at? It's going into the water. It's being scattered 180 degrees out of the water. So it's really beta 180 is the value that you're looking at after you do the BRDF correction. Now remember, beta, beta 180 is a value that we don't ever really measure. It's very poorly resolved in the ocean, and that's the only angle where you have coherent scattering. There's a lot of issues going on. And we're using BB in this relationship where BB is integrating over the entire backward hemisphere of VSF. So I'm just saying there, there might be some issue, there might be some added uncertainty in that we're at beta 180, but we're using BB in our algorithms. And I should point out, too, that these algorithms were kind of developed for the very general remote sensing problem. If you're trying to invert remote sensing reflectance, you know, given a bunch of different geometries for the viewer and the sun, then, you know, this is something that's very, very consistent. But that, you know, I think there is potential uncertainty associated in using BB in these relationships when we have beta 180. So you've got the VSF used here, and there's some maybe uncertainties associated with this. I mean, this was developed for case one waters, clear waters. I think nominally for chlorophyll values less than one. So trying to adapt this to case two waters, um, there's a person uh, who's funded through the Na NASA Pace Science Team right now, Mary Terena, who's working on that uh, for coastal case two waters. Um, but it's a challenge. And so you'll have you know, VSF-related uncertainties here. You may have VSF-related uncertainties going from beta 180 to BB. And there's also VSF uncertainties in this proportionality, to be known as F over Q, between the two. So, so this has kind of been the topic of some of the things that we're working on for the PACE science team. And there's been other algorithms that have been developed that explicitly include the volume scattering function. So this is one by Zonnefeld, and this one's by Yerloff also includes the volume scattering function explicitly, where you have the solar zenith and pi, assuming that you're looking at nadir reflection. Um, this is the scattering angle that's made. And if you, if you do some rework of these equations, they're actually very, very similar. Uh, you can get Ron's algorithm completely in terms of the phase function, so this beta normalized to B and the scattering albedo, which is B over C. And you can do the exact same thing for Yerloff. And here you can see it, beta over B. And then if you add a B here, then you can put B over C. And those, the product of those two is going to give you what he has here. So what's, what's nice about this is potentially you could get to this point, atmospheric correct. And instead of doing the BRDF, go straight to an algorithm that kind of includes all that stuff, includes the BRDF. And it also includes the relationship with the other um, IOPs, so it's something that we're starting to work on. And then you need VSF information to stick in here. And part of the, um, the shape analysis that we're doing right now is to try to get clusters um, 
just try to basically understand how much, um, how many variables we need to co to completely well explain most of the variability in the VSF shape parameter. And with two clusters and a phase function, it's essentially one because you've got one added so much, and you've got one minus alpha, you know, for the other one. So you're adding the two together. So you could also use VS information from VSF information from a pace polarimeter, which is planned to be coupled with the uh, the ocean color imager. Or without um, polarimetry, you could use representative phase functions, which is kind of what I was just talking about. And it's essentially basis vectors, very similar to the basis vectors for the spectral shapes of absorption and scattering that, that we use in um, other semi-analytical um, algorithms. And the fact that you need VSF information to do this, I mean, you have to consider that you have to have VS information to do the BRDF as well. It's in this whole process as well. So, and here it's estimated based on chlorophyll concentration through an iterative process. So anyway, um, it's just, I, I like this, this approach potentially because it's very explicit where your uncertainties are with the VSF, and, which is very important obviously for the reflected light. Whereas in the approach now, which is kind of an am amalgamation of approaches, it's, it's buried in there. It's very difficult to, um, to fully uh, parameterize it. So using that Zonnefeld algorithm for a variety of stations from four different locations in the world, we calculated remote sensing reflectance. And Zonnefeld are these inverted triangles. The measured values are in red, and then hydrolyte simulated values are in black. And the most important thing is that in almost every case, it matches really well with hydrolyte simulations full radiative transfer theory. So this relatively simple approximation here is, is doing a really good job. Um, you know, there's some discrepancies with respect to the, the measured values. This is a big one, and we, this is shallow water, so we think we know what's causing this one. Um, and we're trying to figure out just what the discrepancies are with the, relative to the, the measured re remote sensing reflectance. But, you know, hydrolyte, we're seeing the same kinds of things that we see with this very, very simple approximation as well. So um, anyway, this is what we're working on right now for PACE, but it's very you know, appropriate, I think, for um, thinking about ocean color and the role of scattering in ocean color. The other thing to point out, too, is that the, the Fournier for N phase function that can be used in hydrolyte. This is derived from backscattering over B with a great paper that um, Kurt has with Emanuel in 2002. Um, and if we stick in a measured phase function, you get different simulated values. So all these different colors are simulated values, but we're trying out different scattering corrections for the absorption tube, that whole issue, which actually makes a big difference in, in all the cases. But we get something closer to what's measured with, um, you know, actual radiometric measurements than, than with the, uh, the Fournier for N phase function. So using the phase function, the phase function matters, we know that. But this is actually a case where it was one of the biggest discrepancies. I should say that in the vast majority of cases, the phase function um, uh, model works very, very, the Fournier Ferrand phase function model works very, very well. And estimating from BB over B works well as well. So, so much to do. So I talked about all the different things throughout the talk that, you know, kind of where we are in the, the kind of envelope of our knowledge and things that still need to be done. So I'm just going to summarize them all here. The first one is that depolarization ratio for pure water. You know, what is the value? You know, it's probably somewhere around here, but there's really a great opportunity for a really careful experiment to, um, to pinpoint that. The effect of salts, again, you know, we talked about, and we only have that one Morel 1968 experiment. We need more experimental data on that. It's a 30% effect, you know, for typical seawater. Spectral scattering. Um, you know, we've shown a lot of plots of spectral scattering, uh, and even for BB, we've shown a lot of plots for spectral scattering. Almost all of that comes from modeling. We do not have a hyperspectral backscattering sensor, and we have very little knowledge, really. You know, we, for the algorithm, it's always approximated as a power law with a certain slope, but we actually do not have measurements for that. It's very important. The phase function shape, and, you know, one of those controversial issues in our community is, does this phase function shape change spectrally? Specifically, something like BB over B, does it change spectrally? So 
modeling is telling us that it doesn't. If you add absorption, then it creates anomalous dispersion effects, which don't affect BB in the exact same way it affects B, so it creates some ripples in there. But it's still pretty close. You know, the, the approximation that BB over B is spectrally independent is still pretty good. But other people are saying that in specific environments, specifically like in a, you know, a bloom of algae, certain size, whatever, that this could actually change substantially. So it's a big question. And I also put anomalous dispersion just because um, you know, Darius did some work in the 80s on this. Ron did some work in the 90s on this with other people. But um, it really hasn't been looked at in a long time. And there's information there. There's information about packaging. Um, I think coupling anomalous dispersion calculations with measurements of absorption and scattering can be used to tell, more, tell us more about the population of particles. Beta 180 again. We do not have a sensor to even measure it, and it's a big question mark, especially uh, you know, if we're looking at Nader um, viewing for remote sensing and the solar sun is at zenith, it's, it's an important parameter. Scattering by non-spherical complex particle populations, you know, still like the most complex particles we've really modeled is like what I would show a triangle, triangular prism with a nucleus in it. So there's still a lot of work to do there. Effects of scattering by non-randomly oriented particles. I showed some evidence that maybe particles are preferentially orienting, which is going to completely upset that um, non-random assumption that's required for almost all the models that we have. Anything to do with polarized scattering? There's very, very little that's been done on polarized scattering. Ocean color algorithms that include the VSF, kind of a, something I'm certainly interested in, and I'm sure there's a lot more. <laughs> so time is it? So I'm really, am I early? I'm really like 15 minutes. It's not too bad. Perfect. For questions, I planned it that way. All right. Yeah, thanks. Your thanks. Any questions? I have a comment on this, uh, you know, PRDF correction because, you know, as you said, that's based on the case model not our model for let it be clear whether that's what is applied to many of the remote sensing uh, uh, algorithms for the moment. We, we did a number of measurements actually for, you know, how the radiants are distributed in uh, turbid waters and uh, that's an ongoing work. Surprisingly, it looks like, you know, this uh, BRDF model for relatively clear water, or so case one water, still apply relatively well to, you know, so my feeling is it might be that, you know, the BSF is obviously different because you have mineral particles or, you know, whatever. But maybe you have, because you have multiple scattering, then maybe, you know, that's a bit more uh, lost. I mean, the fact that the BSF is different, but it's a bit lost because of multiple scattering. I don't know. Uh, I think Ken Voss has a paper that shows that as well, that, okay, this correction is not doing such a bad job even in the, in the you know, relative determined water. So, at least there is maybe some practical solutions before we understand a bit better really uh, what's going on. But, yeah. uh, I would also comment that the Sullivan and Twardowski paper, we looked at the shape of scattering in the backward direction. That was an enormous data set from all over the world, you know, case two, case one waters, even in really thick blooms, and we saw a very consistent shape. So it's not very, it looks like it's not a strong function of particle composition which would back up what you're saying. As long as that shape is, is similar, you yeah. know. Yeah. When you show the wedding function for the backscattering centers, like the AQBB with the really broad distribution that goes down or back down back to the uh, 60 degree scattering angle, and then there was an EQ at the new uh, with a slightly shifted to higher angles. Right. So if you want to look at backscattering, is that then even a better backscatter center because it doesn't include that portion of forward scattering? Or uh, maybe you can comment again on, on the angle because later yes. you said like 120 degrees would be the best backscattering angle. Yes, I, it is. Um, I think I had a slide earlier on, on this. Uh, I had like hundreds of slides I was waiting for last night. So. So this shows why, so this is looking at beta normalized to B, or BB, okay? So 
remember the chi is this proportionality. And this is the distribution. So that these circles here with the, um, the standard deviation for the error, these circles represent the measurements that we made with all of the data that we have. So this is the standard deviation of all those measurements once they're normalized. And the smallest errors that we saw were at this like 115 area. So that's where that, that chi slide where I was showing all the different angles that, that have been recommended for the chi. That's why we use that angle. Same thing was seen by Emmanuel in his paper and others, Oishi. And the, the shaded area here are Fournier Ferrand phase functions. And they actually show the exact same thing. They show a minimum in the exact same place. Once you go out to 90, towards 90, this, these error bars start to increase substantially. And if you go out to 60, I think there might actually be a plot in the paper where we did that. I can't remember. But, um, but we did make all the measurements out to forward scattered angles. This error bar starts to increase dramatically because there is relative consistency to the shape in the backward direction. But once you start to get into the forward, there's a lot more variability. So to answer your question, if you're trying to estimate backscattering with the best accuracy possible, yes, you want to stay in the backward domain where there's really good consistency in shape, regardless of particle composition, and you want to have a, a maximum, a centroid of your weighting function, ideally, that's around 110 to 120. Yeah, that's, that's debatable. I mean, for a mascot, if we were to take a mascot with a single angle and try to estimate backscattering, which we've done, you know, we would use 110 or 120. But you know, if you are going to see some changes in the backward direction, if you are in unique water and you're going to be outside these air bounds, for instance, if you do have a broad weighting function, at least you're going to pick up some of that. But really, the, if, you, if you're interested in backscattering specifically, the sensor like what Ed uh, is develop, has developed, where it integrates the entire backscattering from 90 to 180, is really you know, the best way to do it. You know, another thing about, I'll just make the point too. Um, when you look at ocean color remote sensing and the use The use of the backscattering coefficient in this relationship, again, this is kind of made as a generic relationship for a variety of different viewing angles and solar zenith angles, et cetera. Um, if you think about it, the, the backscattering coefficient for this purpose is really to totally arbitrary. Why integrate a scattering function from exactly 90 to 180? Why not from 80 to 150? Or we started looking at the scattering angles made between the actual geometry of the sun and the OCI for sea whiffs and trying to, to incorporate that into what we expect for pace. And you see this relatively tight distribution between, say, 120 and 150 degrees. That's the, that's the scattering angle that's made. So shouldn't we be looking at that in these algorithms, ideally? Um, Shouldn't we be developing sensors that have that kind of weighting function? Shouldn't the weighting function be exactly what the, the sensor is actually measuring, if that's what we're interested in? Well, if, I, if I'm correct, this is basically your single scattering approximation. It so is. That, and, and that's why you have this xi or xi, or what you call it, I don't know. That's all the complexity of the problem is hidden there, actually. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, that's, so if you can take some of those elements of the complexity and put them out here explicitly, which, in my opinion, this is, you know, this is doing a lot of that, um, it at least helps to parameterize the errors better. But the single scattering approximation works very well for this as well, right? I mean, when you do have scattering, multiple scattering in the ocean, the vast majority of it is in the forward direction. So the single scattering approximation at the surface works quite well unless you're in very turbid waters. And Gordon has a very nice paper on that. I would just comment on that, um, the single scattering approximation, and it working very well for this uh, application. And, and it works for the surface, because 
you can ignore all the forward scattered light. But I've seen some people actually try to look at LU over EV as a function of depth mm -hmm. with profiles. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And then yeah. apply this equation. Oh. And that does not work. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Because that approximation is purely for the surface. So don't make the mistake of saying, oh, I'm going to take my profiles of LU and ED and say, oh, I can estimate absorption backscattering. So just be very yeah. clear on that approximation. Yeah. That's a really good point. Yeah, and to, also if you weight the contribution of IOPs to the photons that are at, actually leaving the water, it's a double exponential function. So you have the, the light coming down that decays exponentially, and you have the light coming up that decays exponentially. And a double exponential function is incredibly steep. So in most coastal waters, an imager is seeing the vast majority of photons arise from the top meter, or even less. Um, you know, probably 80, 90 percent. Question on this: All these steps of the calibration of uh, eco uh, instruments, eco BD or eco BSF, all these steps you have shown. Well, well, I guess I know the answer, but how they perform on each instrument that you buy from a, from a, a manufacturer? No. Or, yeah. Okay. So would you recommend that you know when you buy this, anyway, you should do this in the lab if you have the possibility to do it? on each instrument that you have, or that might be superfluous, or is it? Right. That was actually the topic of some other slides I took out. Um, so years ago, we provided these theoretical coefficients for wet labs. So then they could do their own calibrations with beads for every single sensor, get counts per B, and then multiply that times that theoretical value to get the scaling factor. Um, they. Um, because, because of cost of the beads, essentially, they're the very good quality beads, they're not using the very good quality beads, so they're using other kinds of beads. So we did our best calculating um, the coefficients for those beads. Um, and I would, I would say that, you know, when we do our own calibrations from sensors that are just coming back from wet labs, and we really only send wet, we actually never send eco sensors to wet labs, so if we buy one, and it comes with the calibration, we do our own calibration. There are significant discrepancies usually, and the discrepancies are kind of all over the place. Um, but we've seen up to like 20 or 30 percent discrepancies, and and honestly, um, we don't know why a lot of cases, you know, because you don't see the data that they collect, you know, with the beads in the lab. Um, there's we, well, we so. There was something I actually proposed. I could talk about this for a really long time. But it, it was something I proposed uh, that was a virtual calibration technique or a vicarious calibration technique where they send a sensor to us, sort of like an EcoBB, and we calibrate it as well as we possibly can. And then we send it back to them. Everything's calibrated vicariously to that sensor. And when you think about it, um, you can vicariously calibrate it. You don't have to use beads. You could use just what we call Arizona road dust, which sounds you know generic or um, I don't know, but it's actually a very um, specific uh, particle standard. It's a very broad size distribution. Um, so, and it's cheap. So you can do all your calibrations in that. You get your scaling factor, and you can ship it. Um, and it was never implemented. So um, you know, that's all I can say. There's, there's ways that, that we've uh, developed, approaches that we've developed, would be far, far simpler than what Wet Labs doing, is doing now, be far more economical. There's a bunch of benefits, but it still hasn't been implemented. But we do all our calibrations ourselves. Um, what you can do is, uh, like they typically don't do a NIST calibration with, say, 0.1, be 0 .1 micron beads, which is what we do. You can specifically request that, I believe, and they'll do it for you. Well, I was asking the question, just, you know, maybe to emphasize this point that's, you know, all these instruments, and that's, a genetic, well, that's not only the eco things or whatever, but they always measure something which is somewhat related to the quantity we want to measure. So hopefully it's you know, sometimes relatively uh, highly collected, and, uh, but sometimes a bit less. Well, there are all this complexity that was uh, really clearly appearing in what Mike uh, presented today. I think that's really the main point. One of the main points, I guess, of this week, 
is if we could have well probably a number of you have already this feeling but uh, and this understanding but of you know um, the importance of really exactly understanding what's going on with the physics of the problem that's what the we had at the beginning of the week but then how you connect that with this relatively simple instruments by the way at the end yeah uh, relatively simple instrument that give you a rough idea of uh, what's going on so all these calibration steps and we have been working on that uh, yesterday and we'll be doing this this afternoon as well again that's really the, the important uh, part and you know sometimes it's a bit you know you may not have exactly the capability in your lab it's it can be uh, quite time consuming and painful and whatever but, you know. there's a variety of checks you can do too with your data you know and i think Probably Manuel and Connor are going to go through some of those. But. Yeah, so this is another concept that I think is tremendously important that you, you internalize. It's the concept of closure. If you have a single instrument measuring something and you rely on it, you have no sense of uncertainty. If you have two different instruments at least, or a model and an instrument that you can check independently whether the number you got is good, your data is that much more valuable. So be extremely cautious. If you can, always, if you haven't, Quantity that's important for you. Always have diff at least two different ways to get there, with instruments and with instruments and model, and then you gain confidence in those measures because every instrument will give you a number. So just because there's a number doesn't mean it's a good number. So it's really critical. It's been my observation over 15 years now that what actually is done is that all of these steps, all of the instruments, are all assumed to be perfect. And then the final disagreement with RRS, let's say, is always attributed to hydrolyzer. <laughs> so, because it's the last thing in the chain. It's just the, that's just my world. <laughs> and something, you know, I, I think Kurt uh, said it uh, yesterday or the day before, but, uh, is how useful are this uh, radiative transfer codes, I mean, to learn and to understand what's going on. And I can, I can tell you as a non-physicist when I started with this, I did a lot, a lot of that, of this kind of, uh, well, not only hydrolyte, but other type of uh, radiative transfer computation. And it helps a lot, I think, to, you know, understand, you know, when you change this, how the horizon distribution will change, what's important, and all, all that quantities, and so that's a very good tool. Uh, so I encourage you to use it, you know, in this way, not just to, generate some result you need for your paper or whatever, but as a, as a tool to play with to really understand the, uh, the overall process. Okay, other questions? Yeah. Well, it's time for a break for the lunch. Uh, thanks again.